All right, chemistry, this is your first video lecture for chapter 8. We're going to start in section 1, describing chemical reactions. At the end of this video, I want you to be able to list three observations that suggest that a chemical reaction has taken place. Then list three requirements for a correctly written chemical equation. Then write a word equation and a formula equation for a given chemical reaction. Lastly, balance a formula equation by inspection. So let's get started. A chemical reaction is a process by which one or more substances are changed into one or more different substances. In any chemical reaction, the original substances are known as reactants, and the resulting substances are known as products. According to the law of conservation of mass, the total mass of the reactants, the original substances, must equal the total mass of the products, the resulting substances, for any given chemical reaction. So a chemical equation represents with symbols and formulas the identities and relative molecular or molar amounts of the reactants and products in a chemical reaction. Here's an example. The following chemical equation shows that the reactant ammonium dichromate, that's this right here on the left, yields the products nitrogen, chromium-3 oxide, and water. This is a reaction that is taking place, and we represent that reaction on paper with a chemical equation. Chemical equations are a way to describe chemical reactions using symbols. The materials undergoing the chemical reaction are the reactants. The materials created by the chemical reaction are the products. Individual atoms and molecules in the reaction are separated by plus signs. The relative amount of each reactant or product is shown in front of the symbol for that substance. Symbols in parentheses after the reactant or product show the form of that substance, solid, liquid, or gas. AQ stands for aqueous and indicates that the substance is dissolved in water. Products and reactants are separated by an arrow, indicating the direction of the reaction. If arrows point in both directions, the reaction is reversible. The products of this reaction can undergo another reaction that turns them back into the starting materials. If something is required to make the reaction progress, such as heat, pressure, or a catalyst, it is shown over or under the arrow. So let's move into being able to list the indications that a chemical reaction has taken place. Remember, you need to list the signs that suggest that a chemical reaction has taken place. These are they. Certain easily observed changes usually indicate that a chemical reaction has occurred. One, the evolution of energy in the form of heat and or light. Number two, the production of a gas, usually seen as bubbles. Number three, the formation of a precipitate. A precipitate is a solid that is produced as a result of a chemical reaction in solution and that separates from the solution. This is called a precipitate. Or lastly, a change in color. So we have different evidences of a chemical reaction. If there is a release of energy as heat, release of energy as light, a production of sound. Now, sound is the movement of uh, particles in the air, but remember, there has to be a force that, in fact, does move them. Sound is just the interpretation of vibrations uh, by the eardrum, and so something has to move that matter to create that wave, and so it, it takes energy to do that. Reduction or increase in temperature the absorption or release of electrical energy, uh, the formation of a gas, the formation of a precipitate, right? That's a solid that drops out of solution uh, or a change in color. And we won't see this, but a change in odor. Sometimes a chemical reaction will make gas. If this occurs in a liquid, you might see bubbles. For example, when we add vinegar, an acid, to a solution of baking soda, which is a base, a lot of fizzing occurs because carbon dioxide is released. 
Some chemical reactions produce a precipitate. When a solution of blue tinted Epsom salt is added to a solution of water and household detergent, a precipitate forms. A color change is also a useful indication of a chemical reaction. Indicators, such as phenolphthalein, change color when a solution reaches a certain pH. We can tell that certain chemical reactions have occurred because the pH of the solution has changed. The production of heat or light is a strong indication that a chemical reaction has occurred. Fireworks are a good example of a chemical reaction that produces heat and light. A precipitate is a solid that is produced as a result of a chemical reaction in solution. When sodium sulfide reacts with cadmium nitrate, it forms a yellowish-orange precipitate of cadmium sulfide. You also need to know the three characteristics of a correctly written chemical equations, and these are they. The following requirements will aid you in writing and reading chemical equations correctly. Number one, the equation must represent known facts. They have to be representing reality. You cannot go on a guess for these things. Number two, the equation must contain the correct formulas for the reactants and the products. Remember, those are the original substances and the resulting substances. Lastly, the law of conservation of mass must be satisfied, and that's going to lead into our ability to balance an equation by inspection, and we are going to use something that's called a coefficient. Now, we've already used coefficients in class already. We're just using it in a very uh, dedicated and purposeful way now. A coefficient is a small whole number that appears in front of a formula in a chemical equation. Uh, we also want to remind ourselves of the diatomic molecules, right? All of the gens, right? Uh, hydrogen and all of the halogens. Oh, I forgot nitrogen and oxygen. So remember, all of the gens, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and all of the halogens. So that means if we are uh, looking at an equation that has a reaction to our product that is hydrogen, hydrogen gas, it's going to be H2. It's not H. There has to be two hydrogen molecule, or sorry, two hydrogen atoms to make that one hydrogen molecule because it's a diatomic molecule, a molecule made of two atoms. So this is going to make or break some of the questions on the quiz and on the test. Next, we're going to need to be able to write a word equation and a formula equation for a given chemical reaction. So let's start with those. The first step in writing a chemical equation is to identify the facts to be represented. Remember, they have to represent actual facts. A word equation is an equation in which the reactants and products, remember that's the original substances and the resulting substances, in a chemical reaction are represented by words. A word equation is qualitative. I'm telling you the qualities of the substances present. For example, I would say methane reacts with oxygen to form or to yield carbon dioxide and water. I, I do not have the formulas for any of these substances. I do not have the coefficients for any of these substances and I'm not having to balance a word equation. I'm simply using the names. The next step in writing a correct chemical equation is to replace the, uh, the names of the reactants and products with the appropriate symbols and formulas. Now, we just went through a chapter where we spent a lot of time working on names and formulas, so this should be some review, which will lead us into a formula equation. A formula equation represents the reactants and products of a chemical reaction by their symbols and formulas. For example, the formula equation for the reaction of methane and oxygen, the thing that we just read on the previous slide, is CH4 in the gas form reacts with O2 in the gas form to yield CO2 in the gas form and H2O in the gas form. So we've replaced methane which it's with its formula, CH4. We've replaced oxygen with O2, its formula. And please pay attention. 
oxygen is a diatomic molecule. If you simply write O, it will be incorrect. It is O2. But note, even though we have the formulas, we have not balanced this equation yet. It's not balanced. So as we read this chemical formula, we're able to get out of it the relative numbers and types of elements present, like we've already said. In this particular equation, C represents carbon, or I guess in all uh, equations it does. H represents hydrogen, O represents oxygen. Then we have these subscripts that you can see on the carbon dioxide, the subscript two, indicates that there are two oxygens for every one carbon. And we see that here. We have two oxygens for one carbon. For water, we know water H2O. We have the central oxygen and then the surrounding hydrogens. What I want to point out <coughs> that is a little bit new here <coughs> is a phase of the material. Right? We have G for gas, we have L for liquid, and then we have, not in this particular example, but we have S for solid, and then AQ for aqueous. The second thing I want to point out here is the coefficients. Right, the coefficients. We have a 1, a 3, a 2, and a 3. That means for every one ethanol molecule uh, to react in this way, we need three oxygen molecules, and we will produce two carbon dioxide molecules and three water molecules. If we do not have these molecules available at this ratio, the reaction will not progress. Now, as we move forward with uh, describing chemical reactions, we need to pay attention to what we're actually talking about. A chemical reaction, a chemical change, as opposed to a physical change. Especially when we try to identify the production of gas as an indicator that a chemical reaction may have taken place. There are other reasons that bubbles may form. For example, if you boil water, you are not generating a chemical change, a chemical reaction. You are... Uh, seeing a physical change, right, a state change. Water in the liquid form is transitioning into water in the gaseous form. It's not a chemical change. It's still water. It was water beforehand. It was water afterwards. Just different state. So the difference, a chemical change is where a new substance forms with properties that differ from the original substance. Properties like density, boiling point, and melting point. It's going to be a different thing. With a physical change, however, like we show, or like the example of boiling water, it's simply a change in state, right? Um, you're going to see this in the process of evaporation, condensation, melting or freezing. You're simply going from one state to another, but not changing the actual substance into anything new. There is also an energy movement, okay? Reactions and energy changes. Energy can be released in a chemical reaction. And we would represent energy being released in a chemical reaction as a product. So for the first example, methane reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water and energy. Energy is a product. As a result of this reaction, heat is released. And so the area around this reaction will get warmer because uh, heat energy is being put into the surroundings. But energy can also be absorbed in a chemical reaction. For example, tri-nitrogen tetroxide plus energy reacts to form nitrogen dioxide. In this example, energy is a reactant. Energy is required for the reaction to take place. And if energy is not present, if su sufficient energy is not absorbed, the reaction will not progress. So with that in mind, let's get back to our word and formula equations. Just need to make sure that you know that energy can be a reactant or a product. To complete the process of writing a correct equation, the law of conservation of mass must be taken into account because it's a law. It is always shown to be true. The relative amounts of reactants and products represented in the equation must be adjusted so that the numbers and types of atoms are the same on both sides of the equation. This process is called balancing an equation and is carried out by inserting coefficients, not changing subscripts on formulas. No, no, no. 
that will change the reaction into representing a different reaction. All we can do is insert and modify coefficients, the relative amounts of those substances. So to balance an equation, begin by counting atoms of elements that are combined in atoms of other elements, or sorry, with atoms of other elements, and that appear only once on each side of the equation. Now, this isn't a hard and fast rule. This is just a way that'll make it a little bit more simple on you. So for example, we look at the methane reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water that wasn't balanced, that same formula equation, let's balance it now. So let's start by counting carbon atoms, right? So we have carbon in the methane, and then there's carbon in the carbon dioxide on the product side. Let's begin by counting the carbon atoms. We see that there's one carbon on each side. So carbon is already balanced in this equation. Now, two additional hydrogen atoms are needed on the right side of the equation. I can count four hydrogens on the reactant side, only four, sorry, only two on the product side. And so I insert the coefficient of two in front of H2O. It's shown here in white, right? This, that is the coefficient that I have inserted. Now it's not done, it's better than it was, but it's only partially balanced. So we've balanced the carbons, we've balanced the hydrogens, now we need to consider the number of oxygen atoms. So we'll increase, after we count the number of oxygens on each side, there are two on the reactant side, there are actually four on the product side, we will increase the number of oxygen atoms on the left side to four by placing a coefficient of two in front of the molecular formula for oxygen. So the correct chemical equation or balanced formula equation, right? That's a key thing that you wanna read in quiz questions and test questions to, to know what you're being asked to produce. A balanced formula equation for the burning of methane and oxygen is CH4 in the gas reacts with 2O2 in the gas to yield one CO2 in the gas and two H2Os also in the gas phase. Now there are going to be a lot of extra symbols that we use to represent different parts of a reaction. Uh, we have the forward arrow that just means yields and indicates the result of a reaction. Uh, we have <clears throat> arrows pointed in both directions. Uh, this is a reversible reaction. It can actually go uh, both ways. We have S representing the solid state, especially a precipitate. Um, instead of identifying something as simply being solid, we can specifically identify it as a precipitate, which is useful quite a bit of the time, but instead of writing an S to show this in the solid state, we write a down arrow to show that it fell out of solution. Uh, we can represent something as a liquid, we can rep represent something in the aqueous phase, that means dissolved in water, or something as gas using a G. Uh, we can also represent something as being a gas uh, by using an up arrow, right, to indicate that it's a gaseous product. Again, it's an alternative to simply using G. Uh, we can indicate that we have to heat the reactants, meaning energy is a reactant, right? We have to put energy in. We can represent that by simply writing heat over the reaction arrow or the Greek letter delta, that nice little triangle there, right? It means an increase in heat. Uh, we can also identify the pressure at which the reaction needs to be carried out. We can identify the temperature at which the reaction needs to be carried out, or we can represent uh, it, the presence of a catalyst being required in order for the reaction to be, car uh, be carried out, simply by writing it over the reaction arrow. Right here is a table that you will want to uh, be aware of and refer to as you get all these practices, uh, writing and describing these chemical reactions, moving into the quick write make sure that this table is available to you. And this is how we would use all of those symbols to represent a reaction and then balance that equation, right? We can count. We actually want to write down on our piece of paper how many of each type of atom we have. Notice this top, this top uh, line here talking about molecules, CH4 plus 2O2 react to form CO2 and 2H2Os. You don't want to get in the habit of counting the atoms in your head. You actually want to write them down on the piece of paper. I want to write down that there's one carbon and four hydrogens. Write down that there are four oxygens. Write down that there's one carbon and two oxygens. Write down that there are four hydrogens and two oxygens. Write that down on your piece of paper. 
there are going to be students that miss points because they try to do this in their head. So let's work through a sample here. Write a word and formula equation for the chemical reaction that occurs when solid sodium oxide is added to water at room temperature and forms sodium hydroxide, which is dissolved in water. Include the symbols for the physical states in the formula equation and then balance the formula equation to give a balanced chemical equation. Let's take a look here. So the word equation must show the reactants sodium oxide and water to the left of the reaction arrow because they are the reactants. The product, which was sodium hydroxide, must appear to the right of the arrow. And so we'll start with the word equation here. Sodium oxide plus water reacts to form sodium hydroxide. Sodium has an oxidation state of plus one because it's a main group one metal. Uh, oxygen usually has an oxidation, oxidation state of minus two and that a hydroxide ion has a charge of minus one. Because of these things which we practiced last chapter, we know that the, uh, the formula for each of these substances for sodium oxide is Na2O, water is H2O, and sodium hydroxide is NaOH. Now we have the formula equation, but it's not balanced. So next step, actually we're not balancing yet. Let's make sure we insert um, the states of phase. Oh, too fast. States of phase, sodium, uh, sodium oxide is in the solid phase. The water, it's dissolved in, in water, so it, that's liquid. And then as a result, the product, sodium hydroxide, is in the aqueous phase. It's dissolved in that water, and so it's AQ, AQ. Uh, let's do one more sample here. Uh, translate the following chemical equation into a sentence. So we went from a sentence, uh, sample problem A, we went from a sentence to a formula equation. Now let's go from a formula equation to a sentence. So BaCl2 in the aqueous phase plus Na2CrO4 in the aqueous phase react to form BaCrO4 in the solid phase and two NaCl's in the aqueous phase. So the aqueous solutions of barium chloride and the sodium chromate react to produce a precipitate of barium chromate plus sodium chloride in aqueous solution, right? Simply writing down what you would have to say out loud when reading that formula equation. So what do we know that a chemical equation signifies? Some of the quantitative information revealed by the chemical equation includes, one, the coefficients of a chemical reaction indicate relative but not absolute amounts of reactants and products. For example, in this equation shown here, one molecule of hydrogen is required for one molecule of chlorine to react, which will result in two molecules of HCl. Now there might be a billion hydrogen molecules and a billion chlorine molecules, but what we know here is that if all of those react, we would form two billion molecules of HCl. This ratio that we just identified, the one to one to two, shows the smallest possible relative, right, not absolute, relative amounts of the reactions, reactants and products. Next up, the relative masses of the products, or sorry, reactants and products of a chemical reaction can be determined from the reaction's coefficients. The amount of an element or compound in moles can be converted to a mass in grams by multiplying by the appropriate molar mass. Here we go, more conversion factors. If I wanna know the mass of the hydrogen present, I will simply take the number of moles, multiply that by its molar mass, but remember it's H2, so it's not 1.01 .01 grams, it's 2.02 grams per one mole and we can generate the mass in grams of that particular substance. And so what we can do here, and what we will be doing uh, in this chapter is saying, yes, there's one molecule of H2 reacting with one molecule of Cl2. That's one mole of H2 reacting with one mole of Cl2, but it's also 2.02 grams of H2 reacting with 70.90 grams of Cl2. Right? And so all of these pieces of information can be getting straight out of the uh, chemical equation. Number three, the reverse reaction for a chemical equation has the same relative amounts of substances as the forward reaction. Remember, some of those equations can go forwards and backwards. 
just because we're going backwards doesn't change the relative amounts. The coefficients are still in play. An equation gives no indication to whether a reaction will actually occur. Right? The equation might not actually go backwards under those conditions, but theoretically, those coefficients would still apply. Chemical reactions also give no information about the speed at which reactions occur. That is a kinetics issue, right? And we are not going to be doing much of that in this course. Um, equations also do not give any information about how the bonding between atoms or ions changes during the reaction. Missed the picture there, but here we go. So how do we read these things out loud? I mentioned when you go from the formula equation to a word equation, you write down essentially what you would say, right? We say solid sodium bicarbonate react, reacts with the aqueous solutions of all three of these substances. Now, what I want to point out here, just as a general rule of thumb, I'm pointing at the screen for no reason. The states of phase, for example, going from left to right, solid, aqueous, 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 liquid, simply say those things before you say the names of each of those substances and you're good to go. So say the physical states before you say the name. Uh, we would also have to indicate um, out loud the reaction conditions. And so you can see over the arrow here, but not exactly centered for some reason. Um, the reaction conditions required for this particular equation, this particular reaction at the bottom of the screen, it has to be 350 degrees Celsius and 25,000 kPa, which is a unit of, of pressure. And apparently, some sort of catalyst is required. So unless all of those things are present, this reaction will not continue. Now, <clears throat> Balancing chemical equations. The following procedure demonstrates how to master balancing equations by inspection using a step-by-step -step approach. Now we went through this already in a sample problem nice and quickly, but we wanna break this down so you can follow these steps for your practice. Number one, identify the names of the reactants and the, uh, and the products and write a word equation. Water reacts to form hydrogen and oxygen. Nope, too fast. Next, write a formula equation by substituting correct formulas for the names of the reactants and the products. H2O, liquid form, reacts to form, H2 in the gas form, and O2 in the gas form. But we're not balanced yet. So what do you think the third step is going to be? Balance it. Balance the formula equation according to the law of conservation of mass. Balance the different types of atoms one at a time. First, balance the atoms of the elements that are combined and that appear only once on each side of the equation. Then balance polyatomic ions that appear on both sides of the equation as single units. You can deal with them all at once. Lastly, balance hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms after atoms of all other elements have been balanced. Now, the reason that those are rules is because it simply ends up being easier if you do it that way. It's not like you'll get the wrong answer if you do it some other way. This is just to make it a little bit faster and easier for you. Thirdly, balance the formula equation according to the law of conservation of mass. Balance oxygen atoms by increasing the number of H2O in this example. Then balance the hydrogen atoms by placing the coefficient of 2 in front of hydrogen, the, the H2. And we end up with the balanced chemical equation. Lastly, uh, count the atoms. Don't forget that you can double check your work here. Count the atoms to be sure that the equation is balanced. You should have the same number of hydrogens on both sides of the reaction arrow. You should have the same number of oxygens on both sides of the reaction arrow. If the coefficients do not represent the smallest possible whole number ratio of reactants and products, divide the coefficients by the greatest common factor in order to obtain the smallest possible whole number coefficients. Balancing a chemical equation is an important technique to help you understand the chemical reaction thoroughly. The first step is to identify the reactants and products. In this example, the reactants are aluminum carbide and water. The products are aluminum hydroxide and methane. Next, write a word equation showing the change of reactants to products. Remember to specify if your reagents and reactants are solid, liquid, or gas. Now,
convert the word equation to a chemical equation with chemical formulas. Now balance atoms one reaction at a time by matching the coefficient times the subscript on the left side of the reaction to the coefficient times the subscript on the right side of the equation for each element. Start with elements that are only in one reactant or product. In this example, the four aluminums in one molecule of aluminum carbide lead to four molecules of aluminum hydroxide. The three carbon atoms in one molecule of aluminum carbide on the reactant side lead to three carbon atoms in the molecules of methane on the product side. Next, the twelve atoms of oxygen in four molecules of aluminum hydroxide on the product side cause us to make sure there are also twelve atoms of oxygen in the molecules of water on the reactant side. Looking at hydrogen, the four molecules of aluminum hydroxide on the product side contain twelve atoms of hydrogen, and the three molecules of methane contain twelve atoms of hydrogen. This gives us a total of twenty-four atoms of hydrogen on the product side. This is the same number of atoms of hydrogen as found in twelve molecules of water on the reactant side, so our equation is balanced. We double check to make sure the coefficients have been reduced to the smallest number possible. In cases where you have polyatomic ions, you can balance the ions as whole units if they appear on both sides of the equation. Always be sure to make sure the charges balance. All right, let's hit another sample here. Balance the equation uh, for the reaction iron 3 oxide with hydrogen to form iron and water. So, let me just skip something. Nope. Down here. Hmm. First step identify reactants and products. We have the reactants on the left side of the reaction arrow and we have products on the right side of the reaction arrow. So first thing I'm going to do after I identified reactants and products, I break it down into the individual atoms. Iron atoms on one side, oxygen atoms on one side, hydrogen atoms on one side of the reaction arrow. Then I do the same thing for the product side of the reaction arrow. And I ask myself, do I have the same number of everything? For hydrogen atoms, yeah, I have two of each of them. But for the oxygen and iron, no, I'm not balanced. So I'm going to have to insert coefficients to make it so that all three atoms have, are equally represented on both sides of the reaction arrow. So for this particular example, I would increase, or sorry, I would have coefficients of one, three, two, three. And I could write these down, count them, write them down on a piece of paper, and double check that these are in fact the coefficients that balance the equation satisfying the law of conservation of mass. So when we balance equations, we sh we're showing mass con uh, conservation. It's staying the same, right? So we have this unknown not balanced equation. We insert coefficients so that you have the exact same number of sodiums, hydrogens, and oxygens on both sides of the equation. We never, ever, ever want to change the subscripts in order to balance an equation. Never do that. For example, if I thought to myself, well, I, I have the same number of hydrogens on both sides, but not the same number of oxygens, I can just add a two on the subscript behind, uh, behind water. We cannot do this because H2O is not the same thing as H2O2. We need to balance this inserting coefficients. Do not change the subscripts on a previously understood to be correct formula. Once you know it's correct, don't change the subscripts. Just change coefficients. Right? It's very, very important that you understand that H2O is not the same thing as H2O2. There's a sweet, sweet old joke. Man walks into a bar, asks for a glass of H2O. Second man walks in and says, I'll have a glass of H2O2. The second man died. Because that's hydrogen peroxide. That's a completely different thing. Here's another sample. 
The reaction of zinc with aqueous hydrochloric acid produces a solution of zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. Let's write a balanced equation for that reaction. So first up, write the word equation. Zinc and hydrochloric acid react to form a zinc chloride and hydrogen. Next, let's turn those into formulas. Right? Now we know that zinc is Zn, hydrochloric acid is HCl, zinc chloride is ZnCl2, and hydrogen is H2. From the word equation, from the description, we also got the states of phase. So we have a solid, an aqueous, an aqueous, and a gas. Next up, let's adjust the coefficients to balance this equation. Let's do chlorine first because it appears on both sides of the equation. And let's, let's, let's see, we're going to insert a coefficient of 2 in front of HCl. Right? That way uh, chlorine is balanced. Uh, let's add everything up. We see that there is one zinc on the left side, one zinc on the right side. There are two hydrogens on the left side, two hydrogens on the right side. There are two chlorines on the left side and two chlorines on the right side. So it's the same on both sides. Mass has been conserved. Here's another sample. Solid aluminum carbide reacts with water to produce methane gas and solid aluminum hydroxide. Write a balanced chemical equation for this reaction. So we know that the reactants are aluminum carbide and water, and the products are methane and aluminum hydroxide. So let's turn those into formulas. Al4, C3, H2O, C, uh, CH4, and AlOH3. But we're not balanced yet. Let's start by, well, heck, sometimes you just pick one. Aluminum, it's the very first thing in the list. Let's balance the aluminum first. <coughs> I insert a coefficient of 4 in front of the aluminum hydroxide, and now I'm partially balanced. I'm, I'm not done, but the aluminums are balanced. Next, I'm just going to balance the carbon atoms, because it's the next thing in the list. And I am going to insert a coefficient of 3 in front of the methane, in front of the CH3. Now I have 3 carbons on the right side to balance the 3 carbons on the left side. Next up, oxygen. Oxygen, unlike hydrogen, appears only once on each side of the equation. So, the hydrogen atoms are also balanced. But we're not done because we haven't double checked. Write out the equation with your coefficients and on your piece of paper, write down how many of each type of atom you have. Four aluminums, three carbons on the left side. Four aluminums, three carbons on the right side. 24 hydrogens and 12 oxygens on the left side. And 12 plus 12 hydrogens, that's 24 hydrogens, and 12 oxygens on the right side. This equation is balanced. All right, chemistry, that'll do it for section one. I will see you next period.